and this I'm proposing would happen on the fourth day of creation, most of the expansion of, of the universe would have happened during that time. Russ, is there a solid theoretical basis for what you're saying? Yes, this follows directly from Einstein's theory of general relativity. And there are things called black holes that you've heard about. And in Stephen Hawking's book, A Brief History of Time, he reaches a section where he talks about black holes. And he talks about an astronaut falling into the event horizon of the black hole. Now, the event horizon is a place where these time dilation effects due to gravity become very strong. And for a small black hole, gravitational forces at the event horizon are very strong. Paradoxically, the more mass that's in a black hole, the bigger the event horizon is and the less strong those forces are. And for a cosmic-sized black hole, one, one that has all the mass of the universe in it, the forces at the event horizon are not strong at all. Here, John, we're uh, looking at a cross-section of a black hole. And what, what we've done is we've compressed all of our three-dimensional space down to two-dimensional space. So that now the fabric of space is flat. And we have to do this to be able to visualize what the equations of general relativity are saying. But imagine that this sheet is like a rubber membrane and now we put some sand on this sheet. Then the sheet will be deformed downward and you see that in that figure one. The event horizon, this is just like what happens in a black hole. Imagine the sands deforming the sheet. When the deformation reaches a certain number, then that's where the event horizon is. And those of you who are physicists in our audience, the amount of deformation you can compare to the gravitational potential energy. So what we're saying is when the gravitational potential energy reaches c squared, the speed of light squared, that's when the time dilation effects uh, become infinite, according to the equations. And this is right there in all the basic equations of relativity. So you see in the figure a red line with red dots. The red line is the critical potential, and where it intersects the fabric or the membrane is where the event horizon is. And the green line is our grains of sand deforming the membrane. The thing that, that causes this to be negative is the fact that you've got a great concentration of mass. Yes. And it's not a huge concentration for cosmic masses, okay. the, the density that can be very low. But what matters is the scale, the physical scale of things. And when you have the mass of all the universe that we can see within a billion light year diameter, it's still not extremely dense. Stars are still pretty far apart. Galaxies are not touching each other. But we have then depressed the membrane of space deep enough so that if you wanted to haul matter from the event horizon out to where space was flat again, very far away, you would have to expend an energy equal to c squared times that thing's mass. Right. It's a very large energy. This quantity c squared actually does have units of energy per unit mass. That's exactly right. The, the potential the, energy is the energy per unit mass, and if you work that out, it works out to have physical units of a meter squared per second squared. So when that number reaches the velocity of light squared, then interesting things happen in physics. As you're saying, it doesn't require the universe being that much more compact than it is today. Right. Well, we see the evidence from red shifts yeah. that the universe at one point was more compact than it is today. Right. The fact that we have evidence in, in God's word that he stretched it out, the universe being in effect inside of a black hole, inside the event horizon, is not any kind of uh, wild speculation. No, in fact, the, uh, the Big Bang Theory thinks that the universe was much smaller than this. This is only a factor of 40 or 50 times smaller than it is today. 
The Big Bang Theory has it being much smaller than that, thousands or millions of times smaller until it's down to the, to the size of a pinhead. So if we can believe that in the Big Bang, then we can certainly believe a mere factor of 40 or 50 in this theory. Right. The big difference here is whether gravity is coming into play or not right. on these scales. And the Big Bang has conveniently chosen a geometry, assumed yeah. a geometry, where gravity cancels out. Right. Uh, one version of the Big Bang makes this plane infinitely large and spreads out the sand infinitely, uniformly, all the way across, and so there's no dent. And if there's no dent, there's no gravity. The other versions of the Big Bang can be pictured that way, too. So the fact that there's a center of mass that causes this dent in the fabric of space, and when the dent is deep enough, then we have time dilation effects. It's rather startling to imagine, at some point earlier in the history of the universe, that essentially all the mass was inside an event horizon. That is, everything was within a black hole. Mm -hmm. A standard black hole has this membrane moving downward. As a black hole develops, this sand that's in the membrane moves inward. It contracts inward along with the material, the rubber itself. So this gravitational potential well deepens, and as the mass moves inward, but you'll see the little red dots moving outward. So in the shallow well, the red dots are not too far away from the center. But as the well deepens in number B, part of figure two, the red dots have moved apart. That's the event horizon, just as a result of the deepening. And then when the red dots move out beyond the matter, or when the matter moves all the way inside the event horizon, that green shaded area, then the red dots don't move any further out. They stay where they are, and that's the event horizon. So at that stage, all the matter would be within the black hole. Right. The boundary of a black hole is the event horizon. But different things can happen to that matter on the way in. One of the conjectured things that would happen, the, the Hawking school, says that all that matter just goes down to a singularity and stays there forever. But Hawking's co-author, George Ellis, who also wrote this book, The Large-Scale Structure of Space-Time, disagrees with him and says that there would be a second critical level at which the energy of that fabric becomes zero and then goes negative. Now, you remember what we said about gravitational potential energy, if we raise this cup up high, we're putting energy into it. And when we lower the cup, we lower it. We're reducing its energy. We're reducing how much energy is in it. Now, when we lower this cup in a gravitational field far enough, then we will have subtracted from it all of its rest mass energy, the E equals mc squared energy, all of that will have gone out of it. And when that happens to the fabric of space-time, then any kind of waves, light waves, any other kind of waves, any motion becomes impossible. So all physical processes stop. That is what George Ellis and his co-workers in South Africa call a Euclidean zone. And I call it, more simply, a timeless zone. Anything inside that spherical volume there would be no time experienced. In the Creation Ex Nihilo Technical Journal, I had an article in which I was answering some critics, and I decided well, I wanted to introduce some new physics on the table. And I had found that, that this Euclidean zone applied to a black hole, and then I found that Ellis and his authors had found the same thing. So I pointed out that this is a variation on time dilation, that you didn't merely have time dilation at the event horizon, which would be, just be in a thin spherical shell right around at a, a certain radius from the center of the black hole, but you would have a whole volume within that shell, which in, in the entire volume would have time stopped within it. 
It's basically the same kind of time dilation that occurs at the event horizon, but circumstances bring about it happening in the whole volume. Perhaps we could use a few equations here. Actually, your claim is rather simple to understand, and this timeless zone occurs where the total energy, including this negative gravitational potential energy, where that total energy hits zero and wants to go negative. Right. That at that point, the speed of light becomes an imaginary number because it's in effect a square root of a negative number. The implication is that light no longer propagates and physical processes no longer take place. Yeah. And so the equations point to this state of affairs. And the equation we start with is one that everybody's heard of, E equals mc squared. And we can uh, turn that around and say C is equal to the square root of E, the total energy of an object per unit mass. And when we're talking about the fabric of space-time, we're talking about the total energy of a chunk of space-time divided by that object's mass. Now when we lower space-time down through its own gravitational potential, that gravitational potential energy is negative. So at some point, the gravitational potential energy becomes equal to all the other kinds of energy, motion energy or kinetic energy and rest mass energy. And when the gravitational potential energy is equal to that value, that's where time dilation starts to happen. Normally, in a black hole, you can have kinetic energy. The, the membrane is moving and you have to account for that. So even when you get to the C squared level, you can still have kinetic energy below that. So you're not necessarily time dilated just below that level. But at that level you are, that's where you get time dilation. But below that level you have enough kinetic energy of the membrane so that it doesn't have zero energy. Still has positive, positive total energy. Right. But if you get deep enough, then the gravitational potential energy, the negative overwhelms. overwhelms the kinetic energy and the rest mass energy, and suddenly you're left with the total energy, E, being less than zero below that point. And what happens when you take the square root of a number that's less than zero? Then you get into imaginary numbers. The interpretation of that is that waves, light waves, and the speed of light drops down to zero as you approach this region. And then below that region, you can have no waves. And with, without any light waves, you can't have any interaction between particles. It would be a very boring, dull situation inside the Euclidean zone. In fact, you wouldn't even notice it if you had dropped into one. Everything would just be frozen. Yes in a state of frozen animation. And including your neurons and your digestive system and the rotation of the earth and everything. So you could drop into a Euclidean zone and move back out of it and as far as you're concerned, nothing would have happened. It would have been instantaneous. Now, what these equations represent, the state of affairs that really occurs here is, is what is, is at the heart of the debate between Hawking and Ellis. Right that they have different opinions about what those equations, what the implications are. Exactly, and as far as I can see, uh, nobody is answering Ellis publicly. So, so. They, they've let him have the last word in saying that black holes would collapse down through the event horizon and the matter would enter a Euclidean zone. And then what appears to happen is the matter comes back out with the same momentum that it had going in. But through the opposite side of the black hole. Right, I think it's coming through the opposite. Uh, this is my interpretation, that uh, each individual grain entering the Euclidean zone from one side takes a finite amount of time as measured by clocks way outside and pops out with the same momentum on the other because all these different pieces of matter don't interact with each other. So they essentially just pop right through. That's my interpretation. But whatever the interpretation, the equations say that 
the matter goes in and then appears to come back out. And as it comes back out, then you have a white hole. Figure three is a white hole develops. Mass expands outward. The potential well gets shallower. As time proceeds, it gets less and less deep. And the event horizon starts moving inward. And then at a certain point, when it's very shallow, the event horizon reaches the center and just disappears. So everything inside the uh, Euclidean zone will have been stopped, but eventually all this matter will, on its own, emerge from the event horizon, and then you no longer have a white hole. You just have matter left over moving outward. What happens to the energy? It would seem like, if I conceive of the black hole being like a potential well, that when something gets at the bottom of a normal potential well, it tends to stay there. It's the difference between having a trampoline down at the bottom and having a piece of concrete. Normally when something falls down into a well and it hits a piece of concrete, it goes splat and it converts all that energy of motion that it had suddenly into heat energy and it just stays down there, splat. It's a little hotter at the bottom of the well. And that's what Hawking thinks happens to a black hole, that uh, all this matter is just down there hot and never emerges. But what Ellis is saying is no, it enters a phase where it will not convert its energy into heat, but it will keep its kinetic energy and zoom right back out, or bounce, uh, if you want to think of it that way. So when the matter enters this Euclidean zone, there is no interaction among Particles. particles. And so they can't, they can't heat each other so up. So there's no dissipation. Exactly. There's no conversion to heat. That's exactly right. So you've got a galaxy mm -hmm. or a star. Mm -hmm. There's no interaction with other stars or galaxies. Right. And it keeps its momentum, keeps its mm -hmm. kinetic energy, mm -hmm. and just and is able then to get back to where it came from. Yes. That's my personal interpretation of what the equations mean. But the equations say that the matter comes back out and doesn't lose its energy as heat. This is the code word that they use, signature change. That means that space-time changes to space-space, that, that there is no time. And they're saying that happens naturally to black holes. Then you would get this bounce or re-emergence as a white hole. It would seem to me essentially overwhelming evidence now that black holes really exist and that we can identify objects out there oh, yes. that, that represent black holes. Well, if, if what Ellis is claiming is true, might there not be some hope that we could see a white hole? Yes, I think some of the mysterious objects out there may be white holes. Nobody has been looking for them up to now because they bought into Hawking's view of black holes that, that they collapsed down to a singularity and there would be no natural way to form a white hole. If Ellis' view is correct, there are white holes, but nobody's been looking for them. It may be that quasars, what we call quasi-stellar objects, are in fact white holes. The redshift that we see from quasars is the gravitational redshift of an expanding surface of incandescent material that's moving out from a star that was a black hole and is now a white hole. Have you looked into this enough to know whether it's more likely to see a small black hole turn into a white hole or is it more likely to see a, a larger black hole turn into a white hole? Mainly thinking in terms of a time scale. If we're talking about the whole cosmos emerging from a white hole the time scale doesn't matter. It takes long times as viewed from way outside the event horizon, but to an observer within the event horizon, all of this can happen speedily enough for us to see the results. But for a small white hole, if we're outside it, it may take a very long time to go from a black hole to a white hole. It's well, let's get back to the implications of this as far as the cosmos as a whole is concerned? Mm -hmm. Well, the implication is that maybe on the 
fourth day of creation, or perhaps involving a couple of the other creation days, the universe collapsed, entered a timeless zone, and then came back out of it. I have this little uh, motion picture of a white of a black hole turning into a white hole. There's a black hole, and we're seeing the galaxies or pieces of matter, whatever they are, shrinking in past the critical depth for either the event horizon or below that a Euclidean zone, and then that material bounces and moves back out and becomes a white hole. I'm picturing all of this happening on the fourth day of creation. And just to maybe clarify that, the fourth day of creation, the Earth being near the center mm -hmm. would have been in the timeless zone for a maximum amount of time. Yes. Uh, relative to the rest of it. Some exactly the, the, right. the outer regions of the cosmos would have been inside the either white or black hole for less time yes. than, than the Earth would have been. The things near the center would be in longer. So we have, that gives us a way for events to transpire outside and yet only one ordinary day passing on Earth. I have a, uh, a Minkowski diagrams, plots of time versus distance. The relativity theorists use these a lot. It's a little bit of a clarification. It's one way we can have time dilation and get the light from distant galaxies. So along the bottom is distance from Earth, horizontally from Earth on the left to, say, the farthest galaxy on the right. And then vertically we have time passing. Now, out at the distant right-hand side, we have billions of years elapsing. But on the left-hand side, we have subtracted from those billions of years a whole lot of time spent in the timeless zone. And all that's left on the left-hand side for the Earth to experience is 24 hours. And so all of this would be the fourth day. So let's just walk you through the, the diagram here. At the bottom, there's a dotted line there where the timeless zone emerges from, from the Earth and the Earth is swallowed up in it. This timeless zone expands outward and that's that sloped line proceeding up toward the right. And inside it, there's a dark area called the timeless zone. Imagine this in three dimensions as being a sphere, a dark sphere with nothing happening in it, expanding outward. To encompass all the mass of the universe. Exactly. Right. And then it turns around and starts shrinking. Now as it starts shrinking, that's the diagonal line moving leftward and slanting upward. And you'll see point two there. What I'm imagining is that God forms the galaxies just below point two at a little point called C, three, 300 mega years below that point, I'm imagining that right as this big black timeless zone starts shrinking right behind it, God is forming a galaxy, maybe from material that's already there that has gone through the timeless zone, but he's forming the galaxy, and that's a very distant galaxy. And then that galaxy begins to spin, and after 300 million years, it would form a nice set of spirals. Most of the galaxies we see look like they have spun for about two or three hundred million years. So that's why I'm trying to explain this here. And then at point, space-time point two, there are galaxy B, which is being carried with space outward to the right, but galaxy two emits some light photons, waves, light waves, toward the Earth, and they travel a long distance until they reach space-time point one, which is where galaxy A is. And that galaxy also has about 300 million years worth of history. And it too emits photons toward the Earth. So this whole group of light waves is traveling toward the Earth. And then where the end of the left-hand arrow reaches the vertical arrow is where those light waves arrive on Earth. and the Earth has just emerged from the timeless zone, 
so then the light has arrived at the Earth. And if you could put a Palomar telescope on the Earth at the time and look at those galaxies, you would see galaxies as far out as you can see that have a fair amount of history to them already. They, they have spun, they have rotated several hundred million years worth. So this is one way to explain what we see with a timeless Euclidean zone, that form of time dilation. There are some other options that are harder to explain than this, but I just wanted to have a fairly clear example of one of the possibilities for how God could have done it. Okay. As we look at the universe today, our estimates of distances are in the range of, of billions of light years. Right. A light year, again, is a measure of distance, mm -hmm. not time. Right. That implies a great deal of stretching mm -hmm. uh, between right. this point and where we are today. Mm -hmm. So when do you envision this large amount of stretching to have occurred? Most of the stretching that we see would occur while the Earth was still in the timeless zone. So oh, yeah. not only were these galaxies created, mm -hmm. uh, not only did quite a bit of time elapse in their history, but in addition, the fabric of space itself it's was stretched yeah. with a result of redshift, a stretching of these light waves. Exactly. That's a very good transit. point to make. From point two, space-time point number two, galaxy B, uh, all the time that light ray is traveling toward the Earth, there's a stretching of space going on, so those wavelengths are being stretched out. Galaxy A is closer, and it doesn't travel as long during this stretching period, so its waves are not stretched out as much as the waves from Galaxy B, which started further out. So that's the explanation of the redshift versus distance law. During that time, the Earth was still inside this potential well in a timeless zone, mm -hmm. while further away, all of this activity was taking place. Is that, is that what you're exactly saying? Right. I'm sure to a lot of people this still sounds rather fantastic. Mm -hmm. Well, this is all I've done. The only thing I've done <laughs> is take the biblical statement that there is a center to the cosmos and the Earth is near it, plug that into Einstein's theory of relativity, and I've turned the mathematical crank, and out comes a different kind of cosmos in which time dilation effects are very important. And other than that, other than the starting point, the assumption, it's the same kind of mathematics in both theories. The Big Bang Theory started with an arbitrary and very difficult to understand assumption which was inserted for philosophical and religious reasons, namely that the universe doesn't have a center, and they turned the mathematical crank and out come the various versions of the Big Bang Theory. So all, all that's different is a biblical assumption. I've taken the biblical assumption and put it in the same mathematical apparatus.